And I didn't know they were going to do that, but it's a now good thing it's on. you weren't saying anything too racist. I know, really. All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's go ahead and uh, take our seats. We'll get started here in just a few seconds. There are some seats oh, here for God. those of you who want to oh my brave God. the. There, there are a few seats right up here, gentlemen. Yeah. You feel free to. <laughs> I am your father. No. So. You brought your glasses. You can nearsighted. You can sit up front. You can read the slides. All right. Well, we are right on time. Go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Yep. I'm the Senior Tar Technical Marketing Manager of Marantis. Um, and I'm cohort here. Bruce Matthews. I'm the Western Regional Solutions Architect for Marantis USA. And uh, we're here to provide some information about uh, Marantis OpenStack deployment versus Red Hat OpenStack deployment mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, so putting these up head to head, we're really basing this on a, a as objective as possible as it could be uh, to do a full deployment from bare metal, uh, just using the software that's available on, the, on the, the internet, download that and read the documentation and deploy all the way through to a, a minimally viable production level uh, OpenStack deployment. So we can start actually launching instances and working uh, with workloads in your OpenStack. So we're really going to be measuring um, uh, what's going on with this. Yeah, just a quick note about that. We really tried to be very objective and pick metrics. No, pick metrics that you could actually rely on as opposed to you know pick, nitpicking here and there. So uh, Joseph, please feel free to take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so. So what we're looking at here is really focused on the day one and day two operations of what's going on with the deployment of these two distributions. And what we're defining as day one are the initial installation and kind of the uh, uh, um, deployment of your first initial OpenStack environment, where day two is the ongoing operations, things like m upgrades, updates, uh, growing your environment, scaling it up, scaling it down, and that kind of thing. So we're taking those two major d delineations and looking at the day one area, day two area, and like Bruce had mentioned, working on a definition from the beginning and trying to get to a minimally viable functional op OpenStack environment from both distributions. And what that means for us today is just a a, what it takes to launch a single compute node and a single controller node to have a functional op OpenStack environment. Yeah. So we ended up using the same basic uh, uh, setup from a physical hardware standpoint. And we'll walk through the differences between them that we had to uh, achieve both distribution deployments. Yeah, and to make this as fair as possible, again, like we said before, uh, as objective as we could do to be kind of isolated in this, we used just the public documentation and the software that's available to, uh, for us to download. We tried to do it just purely by ourselves uh, without reaching out and getting any support or uh, technical uh, um, assistance in that fashion. Okay, it was a DYI, okay? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We didn't tell. Right. <laughs> So what you see here on the screen are the, the actual um, environments that we built with, with both of the distributions. On the left-hand side, using the exact same hardware, so we had four bare metal nodes that we first installed the Mirantis OpenStack in environment with, and then we wiped all that clean and redeployed with the Red Hat OpenStack Platform 7 using their director uh, deployer. And on the left-hand side, we've got four bare metal nodes. The bottom one here is a virtual, um, it's an ESXi server, and it's purely used in this case as a, our jump hosts that we logged into remotely to then remotely uh, manage the other bare nodes to launch like the web UIs, uh, the GUIs, and to be the mount points for the, the software, just for the other bare metal nodes to, to, uh, to, to mount as the, the directories. So with that, on the Mirantis side on the left, we start with the, the fuel master node, the second one from the bottom. That is the bare metal node that is installing the fuel master, which will then go and configure and deploy the OpenStack cloud, which is, and again, our single compute node and a single controller node on the other two bare metal nodes. With this, we've got the, the networking um, in play already. One of the major assumptions we made with this comparison is that the, the physical layer of everything that's, that's being put together has already been done in both um, distributions, so we're not using those as measurements in this deployment model. 
Uh, so the, all the physical networking from the cabling, um, the racking, all that stuff, all those steps involved and, and defining the software networks in the switches themselves um, are, are not part of what we're comparing here. So they're, they're equally done uh, and the, the networks are equally set up. So Joseph, I noticed that there was a, uh, a difference in how the IPMIs are connected. Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, so in the Mirantis side, you notice that we only have the, on the left, the red IPMI network uh, connected ba basically just from the ESXi server to the fuel master node. That's on the, the Mirantis side, that's only used for the initial console to boot up the machine and to mount the ISO mm -hmm. and to launch it. But on the Red Hat side, on the right-hand side, on the OpenStack platform with Director, they are using Ironic. So the, the project with OpenStack that actually is a bare metal node management platform that reaches out through the IPMI network and actually does power controls and things like this. It does have to have routable connection from the, uh, the administrative network on the, from the Director, an undercloud seed node. Uh, so those networks on the back end, again, those are already predefined uh, from the start of our uh, um, exercise here. But yeah, it's a good observation, thank you. Uh -huh. um, also continuing the, the directors on the Red Hat side, uh, the four bare metal nodes as they are configured are the same ESXi server, nothing actually changed there. But now um, in the, f the first bare metal node that we're using is the, their seed node, which installs their, the base rel operating system, their director software, and hosts the undercloud. From there, you define and launch the overcloud, which is the, uh, if you're familiar with the triple O deployment model, that is the, the end user access point into the actual OpenStack cloud that they're going to be interacting with. And that will be the physical controller and compute node there and their networks associated with those. So from a high level, what, what's happening here is that from going from bare metal and an ISO up to an actually usable OpenStack environment, um, from a Miranta side, it takes approximately, well, it takes 12 steps with a couple of optional steps in there. Uh, most of these steps are GUI or wizard driven, so you're guided through the entire installation from uh, bare metal through usable uh, OpenStack. Uh, and it took me an hour and 20 minutes to do it. I don't know what superhuman it was that was able to do it in our marketing department somewhere that could say they can do it in under an hour. But in our bare metal environment, uh, it actually did take me, we went through this a few times, it took took me just about an hour and 20 minutes to get it fully deployed and installed from ISO. Yeah, and the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 steps, <laughs> that's not this 12 steps that you have to learn. But. Right, good point. So over 80% of the steps in the Maranta side were either wizard driven or a GUI that you're just uh, being prompted for information and ans asking for. It does the configuration of OpenStack and everything like that all for you on the back end as it deploys. On the Red Hat OpenStack Platform 7 uh, perspective, uh, this one took 48 steps. Uh, with this, most of which, approximately 80% of them are actually CLI commands that you're manually entering in the syntax uh, as you've SSH'd into the nodes and are, are either manually configuring uh, configuration files or whatnot before you're actually deploying. Uh, when Director finally comes into play, you do have some nice steps with Ironic and whatnot that are there, uh, but uh, the vast majority of this is in CLI, which uh, yields a little bit to, you know, uh, Human error, uh, yeah, which we'll, we'll actually talk about. Documentation, right? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, exactly yeah. right. So this is where you know CLI really requires really good documentation, uh, as we'll step through some of the uh, the features that we actually ran into, um, and very specifically. Well, I was I was going to uh, actually mention that we ran through. The, it, we didn't just do this once. We actually ran through it several times, so that we weren't using our own human error as. Uh, mechanism for considering the three hours versus the hour and 20. Yeah, so it was the best time you were able to do it after a few times. Yes, right. thank you. Yeah, precisely. All right, but <laughs> from a documentation standpoint, uh, uh, of course, you know, all documentation can always be improved and everything else. We went out to the uh, OpenStack uh, uh, launchpad sites and looked for Marantis documentation. And we ended up with six, right? Right, so the, the errata in the pipeline that need to be fixed in our, in the uh, Marantis documentation had had six outstanding um, in the queue. Now, 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 to be fair, the Marantis OpenStack version seven has only been out now publicly GA'd for about a month. About a month. Uh, where on the Red Hat side, it had been out for about three months, and we typed in exactly the same <laughs> query, um, uh, Red Hat OSP seven documentation, and we got this strange little error. It said, "Oh my goodness, this list is too long for Bugzilla's little mind." 
And I thought to myself, wow, your mind must be pretty, oh wait, no, there's, the list is too long. Ah, okay, so we refined it a little bit. And as a result of refining and putting in additional uh, parameters with the query, we finally got it down to 73. So it was 73 in about a three month period versus the six in about a, a one month period between their version of documentation and ours from er, uh, errata that still have to be corrected. Yeah, so from a user experience that, that we've kind of looked at and what we've found from this is that looking at the documentation from a, a Mirantis and a fuel perspective, this is all evolved directly from the first level of products that uh, Mirantis you know, uh, went GA with about three years ago, and it's all just a direct evolution of that same product line and, and same with fuel <coughs> as a deployer. Uh, to be fair here as well, as well with Red Hat, this is their first foyer into delivering triple O as a deployment model. It's also the first uh, first GA model using Director, which is a, a um, which comes from their their Enovance uh, acquisition last year, their first uh, deployer model. So this is really their first version of, of both of these going out. So it, it's the uh, the first growing pains, which are to be expected. And again, these these are being fixed in their documentation as we go. And yeah, and and, and people have accused me of having a little mind too. So I don't feel bad about the <laughs> little mind being presented. So. Bruce, go ahead and uh, take us through what it takes to, to deploy um, Ranch OpenStack with Fuel. Okay, I, I'm really going to go through this fairly quickly. There's only a few steps for us to deal with. You can just go on to the first slide. And typically, you, you go through three different phases during your uh, installation. It's the installation of the media and all of those kind of things. There's about five steps installed with that uh, or involved with that. The node discovery becomes a, a single step of going out over the network and finding everything over the admin pixie network. And then the, the deployment itself breaks down into about five or six steps. And we've given some rough times as to what was uh, accumulated during those, yeah, what we observed. So the first thing that you have to do after having installed the uh, ISO and booting it is to set a few parameters. In this case, they're setting the network parameters for ETH0. You walk through setting ETH0, ETH1 if necessary, ETH2 if necessary for the deployment. And then it's followed by setting up the DNS services, the NTP services, just walking down the chain and, and uh, selecting them and moving to the right and uh, filling out that information. Now, now you see this as uh, just the screenshot here. Look, makes it look like a, something we're very familiar with with regards to like BIOS settings and computers. Well, the first time I actually ran through this, and again, I'm not a, a professional deployer. I'm not in the professional services organization. I was doing this truly as a, uh, a first time touch through this. But as I'm going through these menus and I'm making changes, you might be, uh, the assumption would be like, I can make these changes on all these different pages and simply click apply at the end and save changes and continue as is, is, is offered on the, the last page there. Uh, so when I did this, I went through and continued through and deployed, um, config, you know, finished the, the fuel installation and attempted to do the verification of the networks and a lot of my settings were failing and I didn't understand why. So one thing that really tripped me up is during this installer phase right here, every page that you click on and enter informa information in, you have to actually click the apply, the button, apply button before you change pages, otherwise you lose those changes. Yes. I yeah. didn't know that the right. first couple times through, and that took me several hours to troubleshoot and figure out why. So we'll put in some. Yeah, we call that a Homer moment. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. So um, okay. that was just one minor trip up on my side that took me, uh, added some extra time. So from there, after you've filled out that information and fuel has been fully booted up, now you're in the uh, wizard-based uh, graphic user interface that fuel provides. Logging in is a fairly straightforward thing. We're founded on CentOS 6.5. Uh, the fuel access is on port 8080 uh, over the primary network. And there, optionally, there is this step that, that uh, Joseph had pointed out to set the IP tables. Interestingly, that step is to allow the public access from the fuel node out. And typically, folks have been putting this on the data center network so that additional manual step is no longer really required because the data center network is the data center network. It's already on it. Yeah, but we did include it in this, um, this example just to be just apples to apples because we did the same thing on the Red Hat side as well. We used the the fuel master node here as the gateway for the OpenStack environment to get out to the public and exactly. we did the same on the on the Red Hat side as well. Okay, so now we're into actually starting to uh, define a cloud. 
uh, first step is, of course, to make sure that the nodes themselves get uh, Pixie booted across the admin Pixie network uh, and placed into a bootstrap node, which is a, a very minimal operating system uh, version to host the, uh, um, the environment and to do the data collection back for compute, RAM, how many storage volumes you have, and all of those kinds of things. It's a very straightforward process of simply booting the node over DHCP, it picks up an IP address and lays down the, the uh, bootstrap image. From there, we've now got a framework to define. And really, there are only five things that we're dealing with in terms of that. There's the release. Why do we ask for it? Because you could have multiple. There's a hypervisor. You can select a multiple hypervisor by the KVM, QEMU, or an ESXi hypervisor within the uh, wizard uh, templates. The networking functions, you can uh, either define them as VLAN, VXLAN, or Nova Networks at the moment, flat DHCP uh, from the GUI itself, and we'll mention that uh, uh, network model a little later. From a storage aspect, you, we have to collect that because you have two options. You can either deal with Ceph that hosts all of the storage operations for uh, supporting OpenStack, or you can support LVM, which is sort of the standard for Cinder and, and other uh, ephemeral storage support. After that, you end up defining which additional services you want to put in uh, to this deployment. Those include Sahara for Elastic Hadoop, Murano for Application Platform as a Service, or Solometer for uh, doing alert uh, monitoring and tying in auto-scaling and self-healing within heat. Yeah. One of the additional things we've noticed uh, or that we want to mention here is that on the optional pieces that we see here on the side, on the slide, uh, we can install plugins to the Fuel Master node here that can uh, then create additional roles within the, the UI here and then can be deployed to the OpenStack environment through the Fuel um, deployer that gets added. So we're going to be mentioning that in direct comparison to uh, the, the, the plugin management in the Red Hat piece as well as later. Uh, and it, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so with this also, you, we have the idea to, to work with network templates, which we did not do in this uh, direct comparison. Uh, but uh, one additional uh, option that Bruce didn't mention yet was that we also support DVR as oh, an option to deploy with Fuel. Uh, so that uh, is nice to be able to, as we know in, in OpenStack, uh, some of the networking pieces can be bottlenecks. So DVR helps to distribute that out and have better performance. And right. That's new in 7.0, right? Correct. Okay. And after you've defined that framework, the next step is to assign the, the uh, nodes to specific roles within OpenStack. Right. So you've got um, uh, basically um, uh, your controller, your compute, your storage by default. Um, uh, telemetry can also be assigned. Or you can do a base OS, which is just the operating system of choice. In this case, it's Ubuntu. And the neat thing about working within Fuel is from the very start, prior to actually deploying the node, you can actually define how the networks are going to be configured on the physical platform before it gets deployed. So you can set up bonds, for example. You can set up uh, uh, the MTUs and the uh, 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 load balancing type uh, from you know standards to all the way up through LACP. Um, and uh, basically define all of the connections that you're going to have for your public, your private, your management, your storage um, networks uh, going uh, through which uh, physical NIC. And then the next thing is to be able to carve out the storage and define how much storage is uh, available for any given role that you're intending to assign to that node. So for the base OS from 50 gig, you can expand it up to however much your disk has available for it. You can then set up the Ceph journals in a specific place for the storage nodes. Um, and once you've got all that configured, what, what, what do you do then? Um, you're uh, ready to verify the network. What does that actually do? <laughs> so that one actually checks all of the settings that you set in the uh, network tab of your environment. So it ensures that your public network is actually available to the individual nodes that it has to be for the deployment. 
it uh, ensures that the storage traffic can go between all of the storage nodes appropriately. It ensures that DHCP can access the admin pixie network across all of the nodes. All of those tricky things that may be problematic if you did it, uh, if your network fo folks didn't communicate properly with you, or if you fat fingered something, which I have a tendency to do. So being able to verify it at the end if it's a good thing. <laughs> and one of the other uh, nice things that we observed when we de first deployed this is that we are uh, presented at the end of this deployment with a default external network and an internal subnet with routers all built in. So we can immediately start launching instances that are actually included with the distribution as well, uh, some test VMs that we can actually start launching workloads right away after this, this point. Right. So it's very nice. So perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I'm going to take over here and now talk a little bit about our experiences and our observations when deploying Red Hat's OpenStack Platform 7 using Director. Uh, again, this is just from the, when we look at this diagram from the ground up, we're going, uh, we're putting the, ma the, the main installation, or the, uh, the, the base OS, uh, doing the, the, subs the subscription management, uh, installing Director, then configuring the under cloud, uh, which is then going to configure and then deploy the over cloud, discovering the nodes that we're going to be assigning for that over cloud, and then physically deploying it. So the first section here is actually obtaining the bootable ISO, mounting it, and launching into Red Hat um, Enterprise License um, operating system right away. Uh, th with this, you're required a, with a subscription to the appropriate uh, repos. Now this uh, is an interesting step early on in the first release, uh, when they first released back in August, uh, when I first went through this, I actually had uh, ran into some issues, and the documentation has been sub subsequently corrected, but when you work with the repos uh, from the base operating system and then add on the o OpenStack platform specific repos, uh, during the end when you run through, uh, after you finish the operating system, you've installed Director, you do another update at the end, some of the, the dependencies for the OpenStack um, were being overwritten by the, the newer, newer. Um, RHEL uh, base OS dependencies, which were then, of course, causing problems down the road. So they've subsequently fixed that. They've added some, some commands in the documentation to uh, d disable the, the RHEL base OS repos and install um, uh, priorities specifically to the OpenStack ones, which, which did fix it. But that caused quite a bit of, of troubleshooting uh, and, and time involved. So this step uh, is approximately 25, well, it is 25 steps of, of CLI entries into installing and configuring the director and undercloud, defining the networks in those pieces, which are on the next slide here. So manually editing this undercloud.conf file, uh, defining your networks, defining your uh, Pixie, NICs, and, and DHCP ranges, and the like. Um, with this, uh, one minor thing that did trip me up here is that, uh, actually uh, two things, that the, the, the default configuration file that is included with this, the example that they give you, has the, the NIC that is assigned to the Pixie network as ETH1, ETH1, which we're all uh, familiar with, right? Uh, and I'm an old school guy, so of course I was thinking, yeah, that's the second physical NIC in my box, and that happens to be on the diagram, the correct NIC uh, to that network. But in going through and actually deploying the undercloud at this point, it does fail. And having to go back through the logs of the installation piece, did find that it was failing and then searching for this ETH1, this, this, this you know, um, mythical ETH1 NIC that didn't exist. And I couldn't figure out as to why. But it, finally, I figured out as to the, the new default method of, of installing RHEL as base OS includes this BIOS dev name and this. Uh, uh, consistent um, device, device naming, scheme. naming scheme. So it was right. naming my NICs um, more differently. So you know, you know, as exactly, precisely. So that took a little bit of troubleshooting. But now that I know that, that's always just a pure, uh, you know, a little bit of human error and just some of the trip me up to cause a little time. So Go just ahead. the last uh, point there that he makes the service passwords. That uh, that's the admin password for the IPMI port. That's no. This is these are the service passwords for the individual op OpenStack Got services it. themselves. Okay. You have the option to set them in the configuration in the file configuration ahead of time file. and it. store that in there. Uh, it might be uh, an interesting thing for your your CSO, but uh, uh, concept of having to store that somewhere. But but the another point that I wanted to make here is that in the configuration file now that still exists even in the current documentation, they have you create a service certificate to enable SSL communications between the OpenStack services. That way you have encrypted communication between the services, which is nice, right? Uh, but 
the, the commands in the first round of documentation did fail outright. Uh, we did find errata that were uh, submitted that showed that the syntax was incorrect. We did fix that, that's fine, it gets through that. We install it correctly, but then deploying it, we come into an issue again where the Keystone services themselves were failing to use the SSL certificate and therefore communications between uh, things were, were uh, between different services were failing. Now the errata that does exist out there still is in the pipeline, is still to be completed, uh, fixed. Um, there are still some, some workarounds to be made, but that is something that did trip us up and it still exists now. So the only thing we did to, to kind of as a workaround to get past this was just simply disable the SSL communication between OpenStack services, which allowed us to, to complete the installation. Yeah, that was where Bugzilla's little mind came in, right? That was the first, yeah, that was the okay. first where we found that. Now the next step is to manually register the nodes. So this is a little bit different than the Mirantis side that the Bruce had mentioned. This is where we're using Ironic now to, to uh, manage the control of the bare metal nodes that are exist. So in this case, we need to go to each of the nodes, find the IPMI address, the credentials to log into that IPMI interface, the, the uh, username and password, as well as the dedicated NIC MAC address for the Pixie network. Now in my first pass through this, We've got just the two nodes that we mentioned, we have a single controller and a, a compute node that we're registering with the undercloud to launch. So with this, the, the NIC MAC address, as we all know, is a fun you know, mixture of, of, of hex des hexadecimal. So I actually did fat finger my NIC MAC address in my first entry into my controller node. Now, IPMI worked, so I entered in the credentials, which are stored in some file somewhere again, which is um, another fun thing for the CSO. But the Ironic uh, correctly went out, found the node, powered it on, saw that it was there, but because I had fat fingered the MAC address, it didn't know what to do with it. It couldn't find it on the, on the Pixie network. At that point, it actually locked it into maintenance mode, which from the director UI, I wasn't able to unlock it or do anything with it from that point. So I actually had to log in through CLI, manually unlock it, take it out of maintenance mode, and then delete it that way that I could restart and re-register re that same node with the correct MAC address this time. So that was our second Homer moment during the process. Right. Don't! Yeah. So, so I imagine doing this with, with just the two nodes that I did, but I, I, I imagine it's being quite difficult at scale at 100 or 200 nodes uh, trying to manually manage individual MAC addresses, IPMI addresses, credentials for all these nodes. Uh, but this is what's really good about this, though, is that with Red Hat using Ironic, it is increasing the awareness of Ironic and pushing it out there and increasing the development of it, which we're all for. Um, we are still waiting for some things on the Miranta side before we enable it on our side. But, but we do like the fact that it is uh, getting awareness and uh, gaining um, the feature functionality. Uh, having that power control of, the, of power cycling and keeping the machines powered down when you're not using them is, is a nice benefit. The next piece here is to actually, now that we've got the director piece and the undercloud defined, now we're going to configure and deploy the overcloud. This is where we're first time we're logging into director, the UI, and are uh, obtaining some images for those bare metal nodes. Uh, they're not included in the ISO or the, or the software that you've got there, so we need to go out and manually mm -hmm. Uh, collect them from the repositories. The, not right? from the repositories. From the actually from the website. Uh, they've ah. got three three uh, example images you can download. They're all less than a gig, so it's not too bad. Uh, did include this as as part of the steps that were required to pull them down, um, import them into the the undercloud to then deploy to the overcloud. Uh, this is another place that, that kind of tripped me up when going through the documentation and reading even the, the checklist that we'll show you in the next uh, slide. There's a, you have to assign a flavor and an image to the node roles that you're going to be deploying. And because we're doing just the minimally viable OpenStack environment of just a compute node and a controller node, I, my first time through, only assigned flavors and images to those two roles and then assigned those two roles to the two compute or the two physical nodes I was using attempted to deploy. The checklist said I was actually okay, but it did fail with the fact that, oh, I didn't have those defined, those definitions set for all of the default roles even though I wasn't using them. Right, including storage, which you didn't have a node to do. Uh, precisely right. So, so with this, uh, one of the, the observations that we made is that there's no, no active pre-deployment verification tool. We do have a, a, a nice checklist there that you can see at the bottom right of your screen. It does show that you've gone to each of the configuration pages and made changes. 
But our observation is that it wasn't really doing any functional checks beyond that. Outside of the fact that you did go to this page and make some changes, it didn't test it. For as um, uh, just the comment I made before, I was I uh, did as this checklist shows assign a role for a controller and a compute. I did that. I tried to deploy, but it still failed. Um, with this, after we did get this truly deployed, we did run into a couple more issues here. We do have a fully um, base OpenStack deployment, which is great. Um, but when we tried to log into Horizon, it did immediately come back with a, oops, something went wrong. And we did find in the errata that this, d this default deployment does not install the Cinder v2 um, endpoint and service. Uh, so we had to manually log in through CLI, install those, and then we were able to successfully log into Horizon. And at that point, we were met with another error that our compute service endpoint wasn't there. So we again had to uh, um, manually install manually that. Manually do that through uh, the CLI. And, yeah, and the errata is, is uh, defined in the documentation, so it is there. It is getting fixed on the back end. Uh, but with this also, there weren't any networks available. There were no glance images uh, included in the operating system, so we still then had to go out to OpenStack.org, download some some glance images that we could then start deploying into and start launching some instances. We finally got to that. Uh, at that point, we do have a nice uh, Tempest set of tests for a deployment health check at the, after the fact that you've deployed. It's very comprehensive. It's 325 tests that it's running, and you can't do these online, uh, but it does take a significant amount of time to, to complete them. Yeah, it represents the around. full Tempest test suite. Yeah, you do have the option of running a, a subset of that with the smoke option, but. Uh, uh, yeah, it is still uh, through the CLI. So now at this point, we're going to, now we've finished kind of the installation and deployment. Going to just a real quick comparison of some of the highlights of during that, uh, what the user experiences are for those main ones. Uh, the first level is the extensibility. And I, I apologize, I forgot to mention the, the plugins on the slide previously. There was a bullet point for it. Um, so with the Red Hat side, you do have the options of plugins uh, and you install those using CLI. You, you have to log into each of the individual nodes that that plugin is going to be affecting and install them there. We do have on the Mirantis side a well-documented uh, open source framework for building these plugins and having you can build your own and install them into Fuel and have it do the deployment. It's really nice. Uh, Red Hat, we were not able to find a, an open source kind of, kind of framework built out like this. The uh, director uh, piece, while being open source, is still relatively tightly controlled. We couldn't find any uh, specific frameworks for that, um, but it, it is out there somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, but before, the, uh, as uh, um, Bruce had mentioned, the pre-deployment verifications, Mirantis has a very active attempt to go out and test all these networks that you've created. Uh, and make sure that the services are going to be able to function and actually does those tests. Whereas on the Red Hat side, the checklist of steps, uh, while it does help guide you through what it is that you need to do, uh, it, it doesn't have any actual functional verifications of what's happening. Um, post-deployment, um, one thing we, we didn't go through or uh, didn't talk too much about was on the post-deployment side on the Mirantis piece, in the Fuel UI, we have selectable, dozens of, of individual selectable tests that you can run simultaneously or otherwise. Uh, through that do API tests. So they cover sanity and functional tests and high availability and uh, cluster configuration and platform certification for the APIs for Murano and all of those kind of things. Uh, precisely. And on the Red Hat side, again, <coughs> very thorough Tempest tests uh, uh, all run through manually the CLI um, test there. there I weren't able to find any documentation or the, in, in the director UI itself to, to run those tests. Uh, and bootstrapping the environment? Yeah, pixie booting. People have done it for years. It's a well understood technology. We take advantage of that to ensure that we can get the uh, uh, operating systems deployed out to the nodes. Right, and, and part of the Red Hat, uh, they, they use pixie on the back end of Ironic. Uh, and we, again, we're, we're, we're very happy that Ironic is being uh, used here and publicized. And it does have the advantage of having that, that IPMI power control uh, for, for those bare metal nodes. Uh, so with that, I want to jump into now the day two concerns. So the idea of now that we've got our environment already up and running, how are we going to maintain it over the long haul, doing upgrades and, uh, and the like? So a real quick uh, analysis, and look, everybody's got their positives and their not so positives in the environment. We've just tried to sort of define some of those in a very 
uh, uh, simplistic way here in terms of the categories that we're dealing with in terms of change management and logging and monitoring and management ongoing. Um, your update processes with uh, between the two folks, um, upgrading between major releases and support for multi-cloud. And I guess that the key differentiator is really the bottom one, that we can do more than one cloud. To uh, There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between fuel and the number of clouds we support, uh, whereas the uh, under cloud can only support one over cloud at this time. Right, right. We'll talk more about each of these and a little bit in detail in each of these slides. So from a Maranta standpoint, in terms of the change management, being able to scale your cloud up and down by adding nodes and removing nodes when necessary, all of the health checks that can be run. Um, you know, there are limitations once you've deployed on the configuration changes you can make. Uh, for example, you can't add a plugin after you've deployed and enable it within uh, uh, another, until you deploy a new cloud, and that's the, n the next time you can do it. Monitoring, you have the ability at least to centralize your logging and to pass it on to others. But you've also got the ability to establish plugins for Zabbix, for Nagios, for uh, Elasticsearch and Info, uh, InfluxDB, Grafana, if you're into graphing the results of those kinds of things. From an update standpoint, we've now exposed our repositories for both the Ubuntu environment that we support and for the Mirantis OpenStack environment itself so that you can grab updates apply them with a shell script and voila, you can, down, uh, you can update your uh, nodes in your OpenStack environment. And then from an in-service upgrade standpoint, of course we're working. This is always something that OpenStack itself has had difficulty doing, but we've got a team of our best people focused on solving that for an in-place fuel master upgrade and scripting the OpenStack updates themselves. Yeah, a lot of these, these pieces are, are fairly on par with the Red Hat side. So from the change management, scaling up, scaling down, you know, with the ironic ability to, to go out and, and register new nodes, add them to the deployment is good. Um, they do have the, the Tempest test after the fact, the same uh, with Mirantis. Um, the limitations here are some configuration changes, mentioning the, the plugins, manually uh, attaching those to the individual nodes that are out there. The one, one observation that we made um, uh, on, the UX per, on the user experience perspective, especially on this, this logging, we had mentioned you know, the troubleshooting as we're going along, trying to look at the documentation and whatnot. The, the logging and the operational tools, as those are calling it in the uh, um, Red Hat OpenStack platform, is right now it's in technology preview. So the centralized logging, the monitoring, the alerting, and things like that aren't in production level um, support right now. Uh, so we were we were having some issues trying to go through some of the logs, trying to find where it was we were going uh, with the troubleshooting side. They do have support for plug some plugins that are out there. Uh, they they are um, integrated in with the Nagios alerting and pieces there as well. Manual updates for the uh, the updating of the using the standard cloud. yum updates same using satellite using update repos and things like that very similar. Um, and then with the, the upgrades, uh, from going from OSP5 all the way back dating even before they're using the triple O uh, deployment model, they do have a uh, very explicit long uh, uh, a list of, of instructions for CLI updating from OpenStack 5 all the way up to 6 and to the current 7. So they, they, the process does exist. It's good. So again, one of those things that OpenStack itself is struggling with. Yeah. So in summary, here we got the you know pros and cons. Everybody's got their positives and their not so positives. And you know, here's a list of a few of them that we noticed that we would consider pros. I think that we've done a pretty decent job of uh, defining some of the things that we could do better, that uh, uh, Red Hat could do better in terms of their deployment mechanisms, uh, in the same way as as fuel. You know, so there's a one to one kind of there. Some of the things that you wanted to mention were in terms of the stackalytics. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. Uh, as Mirantis were trying to get fuel uh, into the big tent, of course, but uh, uh, just looking at the, the, the lion's share of the development, of course, is coming from Mirantis. But, there, but to be noted here, hopefully you can read it on the screen there, but Red Hat is also uh, uh, submitting, um, uh, co contributing to the fuel project, which is nice. And conversely, we, you know, there isn't a director uh, tracking right now for, for the deployment model. But, so, but looking at the triple O piece, again, Red Hat here is doing a lion's share of, of development on the triple O deployment model. But we also have Mirantis 
submitting into the triple O as well. So basically just to state that we're both working on each other's projects. We're all trying, the goal here is to make OpenStack uh, better all the right around. Yeah, this so. is our kumbaya moment, guys. Right, we yeah, all precisely. love each other. Right, yeah. precisely. So um, if uh, you guys can kind of read those, we're, we're kind of on the end of our time. So we definitely want to save a little bit for, for any questions that if you have. Uh, we're also, you know, time is limited, but we are going to be in the booth later today and tomorrow and this week, so be sure to stop by and, and let us know if you have any, uh, any observations that you guys have made that we actually uh, wanted to make sure that you guys have. You, you have oh, we do have that microphones in there as well. I think we there's a microphone right there, standing stage, stage left. Oh, perfect. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Nikhil. Uh, actually, uh, I'm new to uh, Miranthas, uh, uh -huh. not much. I actually tried setting up on my uh, PC just for POC. Yeah, yeah the virtual deploy. Uh, exactly. So I see the Miranthas, whatever the con uh, processes you are running, they, they are run as Docker containers, right? Yeah, it, so actually, the Docker containers are the deployment mechanism running on fuel. Yeah. They're not really a container w containing the role. They're the deployment mechanism for the role fuel itself pushing to the environment. So it's not, it's, you'll only see Docker running on the fuel node. On uh, the fuel uh, master so node. That's itself. kind of a worker process. Worker process. You mean yes. Local process to the fuel Local master. process to the fuel master pushing out to the node through the Docker container. But that's not to say that we can't do Docker in the OpenStack environment using, for instance, Murano application yes. catalog. You can launch Kubernetes and then launching Further so then Docker it would be Docker hosted on the VM all the running under OpenStack. Right. Okay. So this is just my uh, initial uh, what I saw. So the main problem what I faced, like I was actually working behind a proxy network, and ah. I wasn't able to connect to the network for downloading the images. So yeah. So you, you know when you start up Fuel, there is a little uh, 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 splash screen, and you hit the tab key there, you have access to the uh, uh, kernel parameters that are being passed to fuel. One of those kernel parameters is proxy equals. Ah, okay. And I that's where you define it. I haven't found any documentation for this. That's right. why it's kind of yes. a question. Yeah. That's why I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks <laughs> so a lot. Yeah, we'll need to, to, to uh, file a bug for that. And yeah. Yep, more errata for the documentation. Anyone? Uh, uh, there's a question back here. C we've got the microphone here if you don't mind. Otherwise, we'll have to repeat your question or have a hard time hearing. Uh, how can I set up the Manila in both of the systems? Manila. Oh, Manila. Yeah. Okay, so, so at the moment, that's being developed in terms of our engineering staff taking a look at it, but we haven't actually considered deploying it as part of fuel per se. I'm sure that it can be as after the original deployment by a, a plugin be placed inside of the OpenStack environment. That's one of the keys of this kind of thing is that the plugin architecture allows you to actually define another role that could be a Manila supported role within your environment. Yeah, and to that point, I know both Marantis and Red Hat are both investing into the development of Manila and it will eventually come in and be more, uh, more easily deployable. In preview. Yeah, our, our, our development efforts in preview. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Yes, sir. Down the front. Uh, just a question for both systems you talked about. Um, one using Pixie and the other using Ironic. Yes. Is it possible in either case to take, if I have a data center where I already have a deployment system that will deliver nodes to me and can I start from there or do I have to use Pixie, do I have to use Ironic in each no, case? No, you don't have to use any of those, those key elements. However, you lose kind of the ability of fuel to then manage it for you. So it's the day two stuff that you wouldn't have if you use some other mechanism to deploy. All right. Yeah, so, so as long as we can d discover those nodes. Andrew's an expert. He'll be able to help you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try this at home. Your results may vary. Excellent. Anything else? Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.